Welcome to the second of three videos on basic centrality measures for networks. In the previous video, we observed that there are various ways that a vertex can play a central role in the network. This video will cover three of the basic centrality measures. Degree centrality, which is a measure of local importance, as well as closeness and betweenness centralities, which use shortest paths to capture the global structure of the network. As a reminder, here are some of the symbols that we will use. Our network G consists of a vertex set V and an edge set E. Here G stands for graph, which is the mathematical name for a network. We use N to denote the number of vertices and M to denote the number of edges of the network. The symbol K sub I is the degree of vertex I. That is the number of edges incident with the vertex I. A convenient way to represent a network is with an n by n adjacency matrix. This matrix has a 1 or a 0 in entry ij, depending on whether the edge ij is in the network. Here are two equations that relate the adjacency matrix to the degrees and the edges of the network. First, we can find the degree of vertex i by summing the entries in row i. Second, we can find twice the number of edges of the graph if we sum all the entries in the adjacency matrix. For a directed network, there are two types of degrees. The in degree, denoted k in, is the number of arcs pointing into the vertex. For example, the vertex 3 has in degree 2. The out degree, denoted k out, is the number of arcs pointing out of the vertex. So our vertex 3 has out degree 1 in this case. The adjacency matrix for a directed network is defined in the same way as for an undirected network. We can use this matrix to find the in degree and the out degree of a vertex. If we sum along column i of the matrix, then we get the in degree of the corresponding vertex. And if we sum along row i, we get the out degree of the corresponding vertex. Finally, if we sum all of the entries in the adjacency matrix, then you get the total number of directed edges. Unlike in the directed case, each of these one-way edges appears exactly once in the adjacency matrix, rather than twice. A simple measure of network importance is having lots of links. If you have many links, then you have a lot of friends, and this makes you influential because you have many opportunities to exchange information. This is the idea behind degree centrality. The more links you have, the more important you are. In an undirected graph, the degree centrality of a vertex is the degree, or number of links, of the vertex. Here we tack on the word centrality to emphasize that we are thinking about network importance. In a directed network, a vertex has in-degree centrality and out-degree centrality. A large in-degree centrality means that many people give you information, and a large out-degree centrality means that many people listen to you. Either of these dynamics can make you quite influential in the network, and we will revisit the interplay between these roles when we talk about hubs and authorities in another video. Sometimes it is helpful to normalize our centrality scores so that they fall between 0 and 1. These normalized scores convey relative importance independent of the size of the network. For example, if my degree centrality is 6, does that make me important? Well, it depends. If the total network has size 9, then yes because I have six out of the possible eight connections that I could have. On the other hand, if I have degree six and I'm in a much larger network, let's say one that has 101 vertices, well, then I only have six out of 100 possible connections, which is relatively small. So this is the idea behind normalized degree centrality. 
we take the centrality scores and we divide by the maximum possible value. The maximum possible degree is n minus 1, meaning that the vertex is adjacent to the other n minus 1 vertices. And regardless of the size of the network, I know that a normalized score of 0 0.75 is very high, while a score of 0 0.06 is not. Here is an example network with its centrality scores. The degree centralities are shown on the left, and the normalized degree centralities are shown on the right. And in this case, a degree centrality of 6 is actually a pretty high score. We can see when we look at the normalized values that this means that our vertex is connected to half of the remaining vertices. Let's move on to talk about vertices that are in the geographic center of the network. These vertices are important because they are centrally located in a global sense. Note that you don't have to have high degree in order to be centrally located, as this example shows. Here's the formula for closeness centrality, which gives high scores for being in the middle of the network. It might look intimidating at first, but the formula is actually quite natural. Let's start with the symbol dij. This is the length of a shortest path from vertex i to vertex j. To find the closeness centrality of vertex i, we sum the distances from i to every other vertex j. Now, a vertex in the geographic center will minimize the sum of the distances to the other vertices, and a vertex on the outskirts will have a very large value. But this is backwards. We'd really like larger values to correspond to more central vertices. So what we do is take the reciprocal of this sum, and voila, we have closeness centrality, and the vertices in the geographic center get the highest scores. So how do we normalize closeness centrality? This time we have to multiply by n minus 1. This is because the smallest possible denominator corresponds to a star graph. And the hub node of a star graph is distance 1 from all of the remaining n minus 1 vertices. By the way, we have another nice interpretation of normalized closeness centrality. The average distance from vertex i is just the sum of the dij divided by n minus 1. And so the normalized degree centrality is the reciprocal of the average distance from vertex i. Next, we have a chance for you to practice with the definition of closeness centrality. You should pause the video here and try to calculate the closeness centrality for each vertex in this network. Then multiply each value by n minus 1, where n is the number of nodes. This gives you the normalized closeness centrality for the vertices. OK, give it a shot. OK, welcome back. The closeness centrality scores are shown here on the left, and I'll calculate one of these for you. Let's confirm this 1 12th value you see here. So what I need to do is add up all of the distances to this one vertex, and I can see that there are three vertices that are at distance 1. There's one vertex that's at distance 2, another at distance 3, and then the last one is at distance 4. And if I add up all those numbers, I get 12. So sure enough, the closeness centrality is 1 over 12. Now, to get the normalized centrality, I have to multiply by 6, which is one smaller than the size of this network. And so my normalized value here is a half. The most central vertex gets a score of 6 over 11. As we mentioned on the previous slide, this means that the average distance to the other vertices is the reciprocal, or 11 over 6, which is just shy of 2. Now it's worth noting that closeness centrality has some disadvantages when it comes to large-scale real-world networks. 
The reason is that many real-world networks have a so-called small world effect, where every pair of vertices is connected by a very short path in comparison with the size of the network. So the closest centrality values can be quite compressed, making it hard to distinguish between vertices. However, in smaller networks like this one, closeness centrality can be quite revealing. Now let's talk about betweenness centrality. Like closeness centrality, betweenness strives to capture being in the structural center of the network. Let's suppose that distance vertices communicate by passing messages through the network. So the message moves and gets forwarded along by intermediaries. And we want to know which vertex forwards the most messages. Since important news travels fast, we'll assume that messages find an efficient route to their intended target. In other words, messages travel a shortest path connecting two vertices. Sometimes there'll be more than one shortest path between a pair of vertices. And in this case, the message takes any of them chosen randomly. We conclude that the most important message passer will be the vertex that lies on the largest number of shortest paths. That's the idea of betweenness centrality. Now we're ready for the precise formula. It's a little notation heavy. Just keep in mind that high betweenness corresponds to sitting on lots of shortest paths between other vertices. Now, for a starting vertex S, and a target vertex t, let's let nst denote the number of shortest paths connecting them. Furthermore, let's pick another vertex i, and let's let ns of i denote the number of these shortest paths that actually pass through vertex i. Now, if I were to pick a random shortest path, that connects S to T, what would the probability be that I is on my shortest path? Well, this would just be the number of paths that contain I divided by the total number of paths, and that's the value that you see here. Now to calculate the betweenness centrality of i, what we want to do is we sum over all possible starting vertices and all possible target vertices. And here we assume that i is neither the starting or the target vertex, which is fine. And this is our definition of betweenness. To get normalized betweenness, we divide by the maximum possible value. Once again, the star network maximizes the value. In this case, the hub node in the middle is on every single path, and there are a total of n minus 1 times n minus 2 uh, ways to pick the starting vertex and an ending vertex. And so that's the value that we divide by here. And we should note here that the betweenness centrality value counts paths from S to T and paths from T to S. Now we have a chance for you to practice calculating betweenness. And the good news here is that in this network, the shortest paths are all unique. So this means that NST is equal to 1 for every source and target vertex. So the denominator here is always 1. And by symmetry here, there are only three types of vertices. The red vertex, the yellow vertices, and the blue vertices. So you only need to do three calculations. So pause the video and give it a try. So here are the betweenness and normalized betweenness centrality values uh, for this network. And let me show you how to calculate one of them. Let's pick this yellow vertex. All right, in order for this yellow vertex to be on my path, I must be traversing from one side of the yellow vertex to the other. And there are three vertices that live over here and nine vertices that live over here. And so if I take my source from this side, I have three choices. And then I take my target from this side I have nine choices. Or I could do the reverse, and I could take my source from over here and my target from over here, 
and so I have to do the calculation in reverse, and so I get 27 plus 27, which is 54. In summary, we have talked about three centrality measures for networks. Degree centrality measures how many links you have. Closeness centrality measures how centrally located you are in the overall network. Between the centrality measures how important you are for the efficient flow of information through the network. In our third video, we will put these definitions into practice using a network created from the social interactions of a group of dolphins.